Oh, meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. I did not know this feature existed. Uh, very cool. Yeah, we'll like now. All right, excellent. What I'll do is I'll maybe pull that up on my phone. Um, and that way I can see them coming in. Oh, meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. <laughs> Is now streaming live on YouTube. <laughs> okay. So I think that should be fine. Um, let's just wait a few minutes and then once we're ready to start, I'll just should I just let you um let you introduce the session or can I just go whenever? Oh, I think you can do it yourself. <laughs> okay, sure, that's fine. Um, well, I'll just wait until we actually have an audience. <laughs> but if not, I'll still just give the lecture. I mean it's all recorded anyway. I've posted the link in Facebook, VK everywhere, so they'll probably be in a few minutes. Sure, no rush. Um, I'll just turn off my video for the moment, get myself some water.
All right, all good. Um, I'll give it a few more moments and then I'll probably get started. So just let me know whenever I just don't want to keep you too late. No, it's okay. You can start whenever. Okay, cool. Um, well, I, I, I think I probably will get started now then just because people can join when they want to. Um, and of course, this is all being recorded so people can also watch it back. So hi everyone and welcome to this episode of the Asana 2020 lecture series. Um, my name is Nish and I'm a debater from the University of Edinburgh and the University of Melbourne. And what I'll be doing today is talking about the fundamentals of principled argumentation. So the first thing I want to do is just briefly explain what we'll be covering in this lecture. But one thing I would encourage is um, if you are watching on YouTube, please do use the live chat feature. Um, and have a kind of communication with me because if we could, we'd be doing this in person where you could raise your hand and ask questions. But I think it's always going to be more useful to talk about those issues that you specifically want to know rather than what I guess you might not know or might want to know. Um, we were also quite lucky and I'd like to thank the Astana team for organizing this in advance um, to have had some questions that came up beforehand. So. What I've done is I've organized this lecture in such a way that all of those questions will hopefully be answered. Um, and my expectation is that, you know, if you have a good understanding of the basics of debating, we'll just to say you're at an intermediate level looking to sharpen your argumentation rather than learn simple things like how to make an argument in the first place. Hopefully this presentation will get you a good amount of the way there. So this lecture is going to cover first what principles mean within the context of debating logic specifically. Then we're going to be looking at some basic principled frameworks um, and kind of understand what first principles means because I think that's a point that people get in feedback a lot but don't always get, um, I, I suppose they don't always get a useful explanation of what that means for another debate on another topic. Then the question everyone wants to know which is how do you evaluate principles against practicals um, and then the final one is determining who has rights or where rights that might inform principles come from. Um, so this last point in particular is very closely associated to a lot of the questions that we had come through. So I thought maybe boiling down some of the reasons people have rights would be a good way to answer all of those and other questions that you might have. I will be keeping an eye on the chat that's coming through on YouTube. So please do drop a message at any time. Um, and just so everyone is on the same page, these are actually the questions that I received in advance of this lecture starting. So I think that these are all really common ones that people have asked a lot. I certainly asked them a lot when I was starting out as a debater myself. The top three, so justifying not giving equal rights to sentient animals, personhood and AI, what makes humans worthy of unique moral considerations, those are all very closely interlinked. And I think that they will kind of be accommodated by that final question of who has rights. Um, the remaining three will largely be covered as I provide my explanation of how I think it's useful to think about principles within the context of debating and how you can kind of build them up to a point where they're useful. So I'm gonna pause for just a moment in case anyone has any questions about the contents of this lecture, please feel free to just ping them in the chat. Um, and then if not, that's okay, we'll, we'll move on. All right, looks like no questions at this point, which I guess is a good thing. Um, so let's move on to understanding principles. And I think the first question we have to ask ourselves is what is a principle? And it sounds so dumb, but a lot of the debaters that do particularly well don't really understand this in a way that's, um, I guess, coherent enough to apply to most cases. And what people tend to do is they learn principles on a case by case basis. So you go into a debate about economics and then you learn some principles of, uh, for example, about equality. Um, or about the allocation or distribution of wealth without thinking about where that principle comes from in the first place. And to use an analogy that maybe would 
um, help you understand how to get it right is that most of us pick up language, our native languages at least, quite instinctively. So we watch other people use language in a situation and then we kind of emulate that language and we try it out sometimes and people tell us that we've used the language wrong and then we remember that and we improve it for next time. What very few of us do for our native languages is we sit down and we think about all of the rules of our languages in the first place and then we try and put together how the language ought to be. And I think that's why we have to teach people foreign languages in that way because if you're trying to get someone to fluency after four or five years, you can't just walk them through every single case study. You have to teach them the rules of grammar, you have to teach them the exceptions to that grammar, and then you have to teach them all of the vocabulary that they might be able to plug in to that grammar. So the way that I want you to think about a principle, and this is going to be so important for understanding, and I promise you, literally any debate is as follows. Suppose that you have two, or more, but two is sufficient to demonstrate the point, different actions or beliefs. And in between those two actions or beliefs, you have a person, here is me doing my best approximation of a real human person, um, that is choosing between these actions or beliefs. And they don't know which one they're gonna pick, okay? They're kind of going back and forth. The principle is what's going to be useful to try and help this person make that decision. Which is to say that all of this, the different actions, the different beliefs, and the different individuals who might choose or do one of them, live within some sort of bubble. And this is what we mean when we talk about a moral framework or morality. That bubble is morality, in which a principle helps us evaluate the value of these two different choices. Which is to say, which is better than the other? Which should I do compared to another? And so on. One of the things that people often say is that there is a bias within debating towards left-wing or progressive arguments. I think that that might be true to some extent, but actually a different part of it is that when you have to do principled argumentation from scratch, you almost by definition arrive at slightly different answers to if you subscribe to conservative values because conservatism by definition focuses on the preservation of traditions and it focuses on accepting there being some sort of natural truth to the ways in which decisions have been made in the past. Now, that is not as likely to be developed as an all new strand of argumentation. And so I think that's one of the reasons this happens. But that's also one of the things that I want you to understand is that principles follow actually a very, very broad set of things. And anything that can evaluate two choices is and should be thought of as a principle. So, in general, this way of thinking has three implications. And even before we can talk about anything else in this presentation, those implications will hopefully get you at least some of the way to debating principles better. First, there can and should be multiple principles at once. I think that because we debate so much, and especially the sort of person who you know, watches YouTube lectures um, from the EUDC team, we kind of think that the way that people think in debating is the way that the world works, and that's completely untrue. In the real world, and I think that debating should mirror this more, if anything, people often have multiple principles in their heads at once and they're making those decisions. The thing is, these principles are usually subconscious. So we're not thinking about all of the different ways in which we're evaluating things. In debating, you shouldn't say, what is the right principle for me to argue against X or for Y? you should think, what are all of the important principles I could think of, and how many of them, and how strongly does my side of the debate support these principles? So the principle has to come first, and that's why there can be more than one of them, because which principles should come first is also a part of the debate, and it's part of the game. Secondly, the principles you're choosing need to be wide enough to enable a comparison between the choices on offer. So I've often been in cases where I've been judging a debate and someone has proposed a principle that supports their choice, but the problem is the alternative that's being proposed by the other side in the debate is just not related to this principle at all. So the principle can only work in isolation for the context of this debate, rather than enabling a comparison between these two different choices. What I mean by this, and I guess maybe this is a simpler way to think about it, the metric or the rule book or the checklist of things that are good or bad 
that you are proposing to your judge has to encompass both options and not just support your option because otherwise it's a useless principle for the purposes of evaluating between the two. And if we go back to this kind of simple thing that I've written in purple in the big white box, the principle has to help you evaluate the value of the choices. If it doesn't, it might be a principle, but it's sort of useless. It's just a philosophical statement rather than a principle of decision-making. Finally, it needs to be justifiable against alternative principles. I think this is really where people fall down the most because they say to themselves, aha, there is a right to life, therefore X. The problem is there's no justification that's provided for that principle. So then someone else says, ah, oh, but this lowers GDP and that's bad because people deserve to not starve. And they, lo and behold, they lose and everyone you know, falls into the trap of believing that practical arguments always win or their principle wasn't taken into account. Principles aren't things that are going to auto win you the debate nor are they things that are going to auto lose you the debate. And any judge who thinks so, and I really hope some judges watch this also, is wrong. Um, but the important thing needs to be, how well is that principle justified and compared to alternatives? And I think that's hopefully some of what you'll get out of the rest of this, um, this presentation. So you might listen to all of this. You might think to yourself, well, Nish, doesn't that mean that anything can be a principle? Yes, the answer is yes. Anything can be a principle. Most things are principles. We've been trained for some reason in the debating community to act as though there is a distinction between principles and practical arguments, that some principles will always win against others, that there are political biases that mean we shouldn't argue for certain principles. That's all bollocks, okay? Anything can be a principle. Most things are a principle and we just don't evaluate them like that, which is why we lose. Debaters just use mostly bad ones when it comes to choosing these principled arguments. So, what is a principle in this case? Judges use principles all the time. And so I'm going to use an analogy that hopefully we all understand, which is judging a debate to try and explain this to you. And the reason I think this is helpful is hopefully this way you won't have too many preconceptions about the individual topic that this case study has. So the judge uses a principle when they say an argument is better if it makes better points, okay? So the first principle here is the nature of the points that constitute an argument is a reflection of the value of that argument. That is a principle claim. It isn't just a rule, it doesn't just exist. There is a principle claim that exists there. And whether a judge thinks of it or not, they also think of the next stage. A point is better if it is explained and contextualized more fully. So now a judge is using the principle that good points are ones that have better explanations to apply or assess the principle, good arguments have better points, to apply and assess the argument, team A should beat team B. And we can go down to another level of explanation here. A good explanation is applicable to this case, connects it to the moral values that we might hold and has adequate responses to the challenges that it receives. So here, we're now starting to do what in most cases people struggle to do, I think, with principles, which is to get down closer and closer to the first principle. And the first principle is really simple. It's just something that's so basic, so widely understood that it's almost redundant to have to argue it. When there are two points that are more, uh, sorry, that are equally well explained, we pick the ones that seem to be more universal, right? We pick, we pick better points over less, well, uh, less good points based on whether or not that principle seems like it is a truth, a universal truth, as opposed to a specific case point that, you know, opening opposition's uh, deputy leader just happens to individually hold. Where we have equally well-explained points that appear universal on either side, we pick a team that has more of them. If someone's giving you four good reasons to do something versus one reason not to do something, and they're all explained to equal levels of depth, then judges use this metric. And where we have equally well explained points that appear equally universal and teams have approximately the same number, we prioritize the team that engages the most with this argument. You know, all of these things are principles of judging. And these are all principles that people use in their heads and they're taught as judges to kind of think about debates like this without necessarily thinking of them as principles and boiling them down. Ultimately, all of this, the first principle we're looking at here is we're trying to assess who can construct a better argument for this debate. And the way that we're evaluating it is all of these things. 
So when I said earlier that a principle is anything that helps you decide the value of multiple choices, it's an evaluation framework. These are the sorts of things that a judge uses. And you will notice that better judges go further down this list than less good judges. You know, a basic judge might say, well, I just thought this point was better. And I don't think that's an untrue metric because we are ultimately trying to convince people, but that's a less well-argued principled justification for why OO should beat CO than it has been better explained and more contextualized. And it is better explained because it applies to this case, uses these values and responds to the other case. All of those are ways in which the principle gets stronger. And we can really easily understand this when it comes to the context of judging. And I think we just have to think about it exactly the same way. And it's really as easy as just flicking a switch for all other principles that exist within a debate. So the more you're able to get into levels of detail until you get to things that are either more robustly analyzed or more obvious and therefore less likely to be controversial, the stronger your principle has become. Now, the next thing you might say is, but Nish, that sounds very similar to how we evaluate practical arguments. Correct. There is no practical principle distinction. Okay. People like to believe this is because all principles are actually practical arguments. That's incorrect because what you've done is assume that utilitarianism or consequentialism is the default way in which we should evaluate things and therefore principles can devolve into them. Actually, it's the other way around which is to say that most practical considerations are just a type of principle that exists within the framework of multiple other principles, okay? Whether or not this has a consequence and whether that consequence is good or bad is a principled claim, and that's equally, in theory at least, equally viable to all other principle claims you might make. People are just better and more habituated to arguing the practical consequences having importance and therefore think that it's the default, but there's no reason this should, be the, this should be the truth, okay? And when people talk about, well, okay, how do you adequately respond to practical claims with a principal claim? Well, I actually think this is part of it, which is that you have to make sure that people realize this distinction is artificial and therefore force people to justify why that practical consideration is an important principle amongst many. And hopefully you yourself have also got reasoning behind why your principal justification is also important. So before I move on in more depth to the um, evaluating principle versus practical part of this presentation, does anyone have any questions on the sorts of things I've discussed so far? Hopefully it's a good framework that we can all use to now understand things going forward. So I'll just, I'll just wait for a little while and let anyone you know, answer any, ask any questions they might have. Okay, cool. Um, so then moving on to evaluating principles versus practicals. Um, so this is a thing that I often teach to my students. I call it the nested chain of justification. And, you know, I've debated all over the world at the highest levels against a huge number of people on like countless debates. And this is kind of what I've arrived at, the five stages that I consider pretty much universal to all policy debates. A policy debate is one in which there's some sort of action that either the government or an individual is being asked to do. Um, analysis debate, so that's stuff like this house believes, this house regrets, this house prefers. Those are actually a subset of this. So in analysis debates, we're normally asked to just assume legitimacies and duties exist, and then just to evaluate one potential duty against another potential duty or one potential way of achieving that versus another. So you can kind of take this long chain and make it a little bit smaller. Um, so this chain of justification is, I think the ways in which most of the big questions that we're asked to debate fall into a set of priorities. So let's kind of go through them from start to finish. Um, and importantly, the red ones are what you might consider pure principled um, argumentations. The blue ones are the utilitarian aspects of that. And then the yellow one is again, a principled argumentation um, that sits kind of across the debate rather than for any point in particular. So 
let's start with um, let's start with the first point, which is legitimacy. Legitimacy means that the action is legitimate, aka it's not morally forbidden. So an example of this would be uh, I, as the president of um, the United States, cannot just raise taxes in Japan because I do not have the legitimacy to tax people in Japan. Okay, it would be morally forbidden for me to go around and take people's money, even though I have all of the tools to do it. And it might be a perfectly good idea to raise taxes in Japan. I actually probably don't think that's true, but that's not the point here. Um, so legitimacy is actually the prerequisite for all the other things. You know, you can argue over and over again about whether the United States has the tools to go over and force people to pay tax, whether the United States has an IRS that's capable of processing all of these taxes. Answer to that is no, it does not, but if it did. Um, and you can argue about whether raising taxes is good or bad. These are the things down here in blue, effectiveness and outcome, but they are irrelevant because the action is not legitimate. And if you're making a principled argument on the inverse, which is that this action is not legitimate, that would actually probably supersede the remaining points that a team has made, regardless of whether or not it would be highly effective, unless the team has a justification for why the action is legitimate. So the important thing to kind of understand here, or the way to think about it, is that if you are proposing a policy, this is defensive. And if you are opposing a policy, this is offensive. And except in cases where you think it is relatively obvious that this action is legitimate, proposers of a policy should try and, if not say it in the debate, at least prepare during their prep time, ways to justify why this action is a legitimate one. Because if an op team comes up and then they say, aha, this is not a legitimate action, you are violating your legitimacy, you need to have a response to that, okay? So that's the first one, legitimacy. Once we ascertain whether an action is legitimate or not, then we fall down to the next one, which is duty. We have a responsibility to do this action. And I think the easiest way to think about this is this is the part that pertains to the shoulds. What should we do? And again, this is separate to legitimacy. So people think that legitimacy is the same as this is good. Nah, -uh, not true at all. I, as the government, for example, might have the legitimacy to use force in any circumstance that I want to. That doesn't mean I should use force in every circumstance that I might want to. Or likewise, it might be the case that I have the duty to try and save people from themselves, but I am not the person who ought to enact that. And instead I should ask the government to, I don't know, do something like ban smoking. So most of the debate, especially the principled element of it, falls down to this duty aspect. And this includes whether or not we have a duty or we should, or we have a responsibility to take into account the practical outcomes, okay? So then we come down to the blue elements of this, which is if we are going to take into account practical outcomes, then one, will this practical outcome actually make a change happen? And two, is that change going to be a good one? Now, for most debaters, this is like the bread and butter of debating. And you know, you can kind of think of it as like, when you're a level one debater, you start here. When you're a level two debater and you start getting good at whipping, you start doing this like comparison stuff. And actually it's like a level three debater or as a debater gets more and more sophisticated with their argumentation, that they become able to do all aspects of this chain of justification. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about effectiveness and outcome. I think that most people kind of understand what those things are. And in any case, that's for another debate. But then this comparison at the bottom is where we basically say, well, okay, all of the above that we've discussed, is this legitimate? Is it not legitimate? Do we have a duty to do this? Will it work? What will it cause? Is that thing gonna be good or bad? Then we have to compare them, okay? And those comparisons, I think in levels of complexity go for this outweighs the bare minimum of what would be left otherwise. So if we go back to kind of raising taxes, then the necessary alternative is not raising taxes, right? And then that is the thing that you have to compare it to as the bare minimum. Next level of complexity is what has someone actually said they're going to do? So suppose you're proposing raising taxes and someone else is saying, oh, but we'd lower the taxes. Well, you have to explain why this is better than not only not raising taxes and keeping them the same, 
but also the alternative they proposed, which is lowering the taxes. And then finally, you have to make a comparison on the next best alternative. So not just whether or not you should raise or lower taxes, not just what the opposition has said, but whatever the absolute next best thing someone is proposing might be. So it might be something like um, keeping taxes the same, but getting rid of the military expenditure to free up more money for everything. So all of those things are the points of comparison within a debate. And, you know, I may be overstepping my uh, boundaries a little bit here because this is not me giving you strictly something about, um, about principles or philosophies, but literally this is the secret source to debating. Like if you want to do well in debates and I like, I can only speak for myself, but I did pretty good at debate. Uh, this is all you'll ever need. And all you will do over the course of your career is get better and better and better at boiling down into these five things and to connect them to one another. Okay. Um, so that's the chain justification. And the effectiveness and outcome is only important once the outcomes have been established as a duty in the higher level. And these things, all of them are nested, okay? So whether or not something is better or worse than something else is irrelevant unless you've established what it actually causes. Whether or not it's gonna cause a good or bad outcome is irrelevant unless you've established that it's going to be effective at creating a change. Whether or not it's going to effectively create a change is irrelevant if you should not be doing that change in the first place, if you have a duty not to do this action. And then whether or not you have a responsibility to do the action is irrelevant if you don't have the legitimacy to undertake that action in the first place. So when we're then evaluating principles against practicals, and we're now thinking in this way where we can think of principles and practicals as being part of the same category and practicals are just a subset of principles, then we can kind of apply them here. So um, this is the other kind of secret source to debating. And if you're a judge, like just please copy this diagram down because I guarantee it's gonna save your life. Um, when we talk about analysis and debating, we are actually assessing it um, under two main metrics. One is how many assumptions is the judge having to make in order to accept the point? So this is what you've got here on the y-axis, okay? Something that has absolutely no explanation behind it is just an assertion. If I just said, oh, but there's actually a principle, it's like principally important for us to raise taxes in Japan, that's just an assertion, there's no explanation there. If I prove that this exists, which is to say you have to make so few assumptions in order to accept it, that you accept it as just being a truth, then it's better analysis, or at least it's stronger than an equivalent point which has only assertion behind it. Now, very rarely do we actually get points that are completely provable. And if that were true, we wouldn't set them as a debate. We'd consider that debate unbiased. So realistically speaking, most of the time, your analysis is not gonna reach this level of height. Likewise on the x-axis. So the x-axis pertains to the likelihood of that, in a, of that actually taking place. And this is, I think, where the characterization that you're providing comes in. So if you're just, you know, saying that um, raising taxes in Japan is going to cause a tsunami, um, well, that seems pretty impossible. Um, and so that would be very bad analysis. You can make that point. You could argue about how a tsunami is going to kill tons and tons of people, how there's a huge moral imperative, therefore, not to raise taxes in Japan. But the likelihood is so unlikely. And I mean, to be frank, it's very unlikely you'll be able to make it seem more likely, no matter how you contextualize or characterize it, that it's going to be worse analysis. It's going to be closer to the bottom left of this chart. If we knew for a fact that something was going to happen in a certain way, then we would consider that a stronger argument or a stronger part of how we're evaluating the overall policy than something that does it. Um, and again, we very rarely debate things that are absolutely certain, because if we did, the debate would still not be balanced. So we don't tend to get things that are all the way to the far right. Um, and so everything that remains is somewhere within this box. Now, what I put on the right hand side here are two arguments that you might see. One of them is seen as a principled argument and one of them is seen as the practical argument on a debate like, uh, for example, restrictions on abortion. And I'm choosing this one very carefully because that's something that I think a lot of debaters would certainly not consider a balanced debate. And it's one that they, you know, me included, would maybe feel a bit uncomfortable debating because of our 
own preconceptions or political beliefs. That's fine. But this is a debate that takes place in the real world a lot. And this is what I'm trying to get you to understand is that this way of understanding principles is not only more true in and of itself or more likely to approximate how real people behave in and of itself. It's also applicable to helping us understand why we consider these types of arguments unbalanced or why those outcomes tend to occur. So someone says, you should not have abortion because this violates the right to life. Someone on the other side says, restricting abortions harms women. And you, know, you can fill in, I guess, some of the ways in which this would harm women. Um, this is because the principle that someone has provided, this will harm women and we should not, requires fewer assumptions to be made and is also likelier to be the case. The flip side, which is that this violates the right to life, sounds like a very powerful principled argument that there is a right to life and it is inviolable, but its application to this motion actually contains far more steps of assumption that has to take place. So first of all, you're assuming that there is a right to life without explaining where it comes from. Second of all, you're assuming that an unborn fetus can have rights. Third of all, you are assuming that this extends to the right to live and that's one of the rights a fetus can have. And actually, there are, you know, I could go on and on and on about the assumptions that are being made. So that's not to say you couldn't win with this argument. And in fact, people win with arguments like this in the real world, but also in debating all the time. But in debating where we're trying to be a little bit more critical about our argumentation, it requires you to do all of those steps of analysis for you to be able to beat that argument about it harming women. And so the fact of the matter is that often when people try to make principled arguments without putting in the groundwork underneath, they end up somewhere here where maybe it's plausible, but it's in, in, you know, it involves a lot of assumptions, whereas someone else is able to put themselves here, make fewer assumptions and have something that's likelier. And so overall, this is better analysis. And the reason for this is partly just that everyone is more practiced with making consequentialist arguments. So without needing to think about what they're doing or that they're even doing this, they push themselves to the right and they push themselves up on this chart. But there's no reason in and of itself why either one of these points should beat the other if you are able to make those um, reasonings more likely to be true and if you're likely to explain with fewer assumptions how it connects to that sense of truth. So then this brings us to the next thing, which is I think what you're all here for. How can I then push my principled argumentation to the upper right? Now, this is both how to make your principled argumentation good, but also how to beat practical argumentation. First point, provide fewer and fewer assumptions. So ultimately you're asking the judge to make the smallest possible assumptions possible to accept your argument. And this is gonna be true for both practical and principled argumentation, again, because they're the same. But what I'll do in the next section of this presentation is talk to you about the one that I tend to use the most, which I think starts at the most kind of basic level of assumption and is quite easy to build out into a range of ways of making principled argumentation. The second, and this is a very strategic way, is to problematize practical argumentation. So whether a judge themselves believes it or not, anyone making a practical argument actually has the same burdens you do to justify why practical argumentation is the principle to follow. And you should not let them get away with it. And likewise, because I think sometimes debaters go in with the bias towards practical arguments, which are easier for them to kind of pass and understand, this is a way of not letting the judge use their own biases, because if you have said explicitly within the debate that that practical argumentation is just one of a number of principles and it has to be explained why the consequences should outweigh many other forms of evaluating what is morally right, um, then even if the judge themselves believes that, they can't then just give it to the team with the practical argument, because the team with the practical argument would otherwise be having the judge do their argumentation for them rather than actually being assessed on what they provided. Um, I realize that me saying this isn't gonna make it true in every single case, but that's just because judges judge badly and I'm perfectly available if you want someone to see a major international and to change the rules. But uh, I will certainly you know, die on this hill that this is what 
judging should be, and this is the best way to do it. And then finally, provide multiple principle justifications. So I think what people do is they kind of say to themselves, well, okay, I've got a principle now and that's fine. Now I can focus on the practicals for the rest. That's not really true at all. Like just if there are multiple principle justifications for doing it, great. Because what that means is regardless of which of those principles any individual has as particularly important to them. And we all know that people around us in society and in the world hold very different viewpoints to each other. And it's not true that one is more right or less right in a lot of cases, they're just different. Well, then also the likelier it is that a side is correct if it fulfills multiple principle justifications. So I think when people talk about the average intelligent voter and they use this as a way to like dismiss principled arguments, oh, the average intelligent, intelligent voter isn't pro-life. That's irrelevant because there are lots and lots of people who are pro-life and who are pro-choice and any set of arguments that regardless of whether you're pro-life or pro-choice could be acceptable is likely to be a better set of arguments. And this boils down to what I was saying earlier about how judges assess things, the more universal something is, the better it is as an argumentative strand. So one of the questions that we received was about sacrifice. And the question said, well, how do you justify sacrifice e.g. sacrifice to your nation, to your neighbors, etc. And I think really illustrating what I said earlier, but also under the assumption that you don't trust me, that you will at least trust one of the people who even came up with practical argumentation in the first place, we can say that even things like sacrifice are goods in and of themselves, subject to some set of criteria. Now, John Stuart Mill, in the quote, the utilitarian morality does recognize in human beings of sacrifice um, their own greater good for the good of others. It only refuses to admit that the sacrifice is itself a good, a sacrifice which does not increase or tend to increase the sum total of happiness it's, it considers wasted. What he's trying to do here is he's trying to say, well, sacrifice is only important if it does not increase the overall good. What he's unintentionally doing here, and he's dead, so he can't disagree with me, um, is telling us that sacrifice or the action of sacrifice is assessed against some sort of moral framework. The moral framework he's doing is whether or not it's um, an overall good. But if we had other forms of moral framework, so other ways in which we might be able to connect our duties to one another, then it's perfectly reasonable to justify sacrifice um, for you know, completely non-utilitarian grounds or likewise for utilitarian grounds to refuse sacrifice. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer to this. I mean, one of the things I was a little worried about <laughs> when I decided to do this presentation two days ago um, is that it's not gonna cover everything. But John Stuart Mill here is falling victim to the same thing that debaters fall victim to, which is to presume the answer first and then come up with an explanation for why that is correct. We get made to do that when we choose which side of the debate we're on. We should not do that when we're deciding which arguments to pick in support of that side. So moving on to kind of some basic uh, forms of moral framework. And when I said that, um, you know, this is the thing that works for me, I maintain that this is one of the easier ones to do and it's got a very broad spectrum of applicability. If you are kind of thinking about going to euros or your case filing, like now is definitely the time that I'd pull out a pen and start taking notes. Um, but okay, so let's kind of take a step back and put ourselves in the minds of someone who is inventing morality for the first time or inventing how we should make decisions for the first time. No history has happened. We don't have political biases. We're not really concerned with any specific policy or not. Well, the first thing we might realize is that we disagree with one another. I think something should be moral. You think something else should be moral. And there's no, you know, no matter how much we argue about it, at some point we will just disagree. Overall, and I think the way we judge debates is from the perspective of a morally neutral arbiter who doesn't necessarily have any connections or attachments to nations or people or, you know, like social groups. We cannot know what the best moral framework must be. And all individuals, we presume, have, if not equal, you know, relatively equivalent moral value. So this is the first thing. This is, a, I think, a very uncontroversial statement. If you stood up and said, in these debates, we are just not going to decide what the objectively best moral framework is. 
no one's going to rebut that. Or if they do, they're morons because we spent the vast majority of human history trying to arrive at this answer. We have not done that. And I guarantee that you, with your three years of a philosophy degree, are not there. So we don't know what the best moral framework is. What is the implication that we can draw from this? Very small level of assumption required to get to the next step. First, perhaps we should pick the side that fulfills multiple moral frameworks at once. Either those multiple frameworks are true, in which case this is more moral than something else, or we are most likely to hit the true moral framework in a world where we can argue how it fulfills multiple criteria. You know, if it turns out that actually the most moral framework is the one in which people subscribe to God or they subscribe to the respect of a human soul, then a, an argument that is not in contradiction with that by definition is more likely to inadvertently be correct than an argument that focuses solely on whether or not this increases life expectancy. Likewise, if individuals have different moral frameworks and they have different moral value, this of course extends to different levels of utility. Like one of the things I find craziest is this maximizes utility because more people have more money or they live longer or whatever it is. We, well, we don't actually know that every single person has that as a kind of utilitarian framework. We can kind of guess at that. And I think we go in with that presumption, but in reality, the less morally arrogant claim and the more kind of intellectually neutral claim is perhaps we ought to pick an option that allows individuals the most freedom to exercise their own moral values. Now, this is a very liberal principle and I find this quite easy to argue um, because I do think that it is bound up in fewer presumptions than others. Um, and uh, also we just had a comment on the YouTube channel, sorry, Azure, um, uh, whether you might move a little window to the, to the side uh, just because it's covering some of the words, I think. That's not on my screen, I'm afraid, otherwise I'd do it. Um, so we should pick the option that allows individuals the most freedom to exercise their own values. Well, that extends to like different forms of utility, of course. I think that what that essentially says is people want different things and it's perfectly reasonable that those things might be wanted for good reasons, although you can dispute that and people do argue about the ways in which we get conditioned all the time. And so allowing people freedom in a way that restricts the freedom of others might be less preferable than something that allows someone a freedom without restricting someone else's without li restricting someone else's liberty okay so this is the next stage of a moral framework and you can see we're starting at what is essentially a first principle and we're getting to more complex principles now i do not have time um, over the course of this presentation to go through what for me is about six years of thinking and debating on how to connect this all the way to all of the frameworks at the end but Hopefully, if you've been following along for now, you can slowly start to think, and insofar as I hate setting homework, but maybe this is one for you to take away and try for yourself, you can connect this to the following forms of moral framework, okay? And these are the six that I tend to use. One of my favorite things to do in an argument is to try and present reasons against all six of these for a side, because it's, you know, really quite comprehensive. Um, but we can have multiple moral frameworks that fall from this. So the first one is a utilitarian one, um, and that's the one that we kind of know and understand the most. The other five are thought of as being pure principled points, but I think it's important that we get into the habit of thinking of them as equal to utilitarian frameworks. Um, and these can follow pretty easily from, we need to be a little bit kind of um, modest about what the correct moral framework is, we need to assume that people have some moral value, that they broadly know what their own moral values are and should be allowed the freedom to exercise them. And therefore the state which exists as an agglomeration of those individuals rights or individuals that have some power over others need to follow one of these frameworks. Okay. So let's go into them in a little bit of depth and kind of see what they mean or how we might apply them to a debate. The first one is the utilitarian framework. And this essentially says we're gonna maximize happiness or minimizing unhappiness. Happiness is subjective, of course. We don't know what makes people happy truly. However, it's the only way a state can externally know what we find valuable. So if we tell them that this is what makes us happy or this is what makes us unhappy, it's the only thing that a person that is not inside your head can really understand about what is valuable to you. And so 
overall, it is a consideration, and we, you know, blindly will see this in every aspect of our lives, that making people unhappy, if it doesn't achieve some other goal, is a bad thing, and making people happy, if it doesn't sacrifice anything, is a good thing. We consider those trivial truths. But next, and I think this is where it starts to get more interesting, um, we can start looking at things like a dependency. So, for example, suppose that there are um, two individuals and they are both hanging off the side of a cliff and you're walking past. And one individual has someone else closer to them than you and another individual is right next to you, okay? So there's two people that could potentially save these people that are hanging off the edge of a cliff and that are going to die if no one saves them. You should go to the person that is closer to you because you cannot or probably will not get to the other person in time. So the person who's closest to you is depending on you specifically to save them in order to be able to exercise their moral value. You know, if I were on a cliff, if I could get myself up, I would, but now I'm not. So this creates, um, and the last word is missing out, but it just creates a dependent relationship is how that should end, um, which is to say it creates a moral responsibility upon you, all right? Same reason, I have to make sure that I take care of my own child before I go around taking care of other people's child because my child is dependent on me. Someone else's kid has their own parents, but if I found someone else's kid on the street, I would have a responsibility to take care of them because now that child, even though it isn't mine, is dependent upon my actions to have any of its moral values. And those moral values can be as simple as being alive. Right? So what we're doing here is we are essentially creating a relationship that's built on how people's abilities to use their own moral values has been restricted and how much you and the state, you know, we can think of lots of ways in which we are dependent on the state or the state can affect us in which you can give them the ability to either enact their own moral values or to do it for them. Okay. So then third, essential rights. And this is essentially kind of what we mean when we talk about things like inalienable rights or human rights or so on. Which is to say that we should not, when making trade-offs, and all debates are about trade-offs really, subject an individual to a state that completely dehumanizes them, which means they cannot exercise moral or cognitive judgments any longer. Um, and this thing, dehumanization, this is reliant upon that first principle I gave you, which is that all individuals have equal or at least equivalent, you know, pretty close to equal moral rights. Well, if you do an action that takes that away from them completely, then you are taking away the ability for them to hold moral values, to tell you what those moral values are, and actually the ability for you to know what their moral values might be and to act on their behalf. And that's fundamentally the reason why we class some things as human rights and not other things, or we class some things as being particularly egregious war crimes and not other things. The harm is disproportionate, yes, but the reason that waterboarding is prohibited, but other forms of kind of forceful interrogation are not, is that waterboarding is so severe that it often takes away the ability of an individual to exercise reasonable moral cognitive judgments. It dehumanizes them. For the same reason that we would no longer for any medical purposes consider something like lobotomy, even if it came out that that might cure a disease, well, getting rid of your cancer is not as important as keeping you in a state where you can make cognitive judgments, right? So now you start to see how these things actually are equivalent. Utilitarianism doesn't trump these because it might be that what is overall good for people only benefits those people that already have the money to make themselves happy and it affects the poor who are reliant upon you. It might be the case that you're only able to do that by putting some people in a situation that is so bad that they no longer have any of their humanity at all and they lose the ability to be moral agents in the first place. So that's why utilitarianism is just another principle. And that's why you should argue against multiple principles or at least think about how deeply you can analyze them because these things sit equivalently. Okay, so moving on to the next one, debt or reparations. Now, the closest way to understand this is that um, if I stole your purse and I had $100 in it, then I have a responsibility to give you $100 back and not your neighbor who has not stolen your purse, right? And 
you know, we can extend this almost to dependency, which is that since the state and the police is the one that makes me do that if I do not want to myself, if I do not do it, then that's a failing of the state and the state has a debt to pay to you. And the state is the one that can do that. You know, you're dependent upon the state doing that. And so that also creates some sort of moral relationship between those individuals. In this case, we're essentially talking about sacrifices. And the reason I put the kind of these three at the bottom, so debts, mandates, and intergenerational considerations, is that here we're really starting to talk about what happens when individuals have trade-offs made for them by government. I think that's really important to think about because many of our, um, well, in fact, almost all of our debates do tend to center on the perspective of a government. Um, but debts or reparations is an important part of that. And this applies very, broad, uh, sorry, very broadly because the government has made decisions all the time and we presume, and one of the ways in which the government is distinct to any individual, we presume that entities like the state or entities like corporations are separate from the individuals that make them up and have lifespans separate to that. Which is to say that the current British government is the same entity, it's the same state as the British government of the 50s or 60s and therefore should repay debts that it incurred then. You know, if the government um, borrowed a billion dollars from investors in America in 1955, none of those investors in America, and I think the vast majority of us as human beings, would not really accept that the government in 2020 should be able to get out of paying them just because they're different people. And similarly, I think that this argument helps us understand some of the reasons why we might want to pay attention to things that have happened in the past in general, because those debts or reparations are a form of sacrifice or a ways in which individuals give up some of their moral preferences um, in order to uh, enable the state to do some other actions. So when we talk about, for example, taking, um, or, or, sorry, like when we think about taxes, the taxes that we take from people, the people consent to us doing that because of the assumption that we will use those taxes to enact something in line with their moral preference. And that moral preference doesn't have to be a selfish one. There are tons of people who are perfectly happy paying some amount of money for some social benefit that will never ever affect them. You know, I don't care whether my tax dollars go and build a road up in Scotland somewhere. But there is in some way a debt that gets incurred in which the government should not then use my money to do things I completely don't want to, right? And likewise, if the government has forcibly taken something away from me, or forcibly subjecting me to a situation where I lose those things, then perhaps the government ought to try and make sure that that's repaid before it takes into account other things. These are all debatable, that's the whole point. Um, but you know, this is really where the argument of um, reparations comes from. It's really centered around that first thing of all individuals have equal moral value. And then some of the stuff we've been talking about in which essentially they've given up some of that moral value forcibly by a state and this forms a relationship between them. Okay, so this leads us very nicely to mandate, which is the gray box. People use the word mandate all the time in debates and they mostly use it wrong. So let's take a look at what I think the best way to think about it is. So the important thing to take away here is mandates at least in the sense of a debate, do not need to exist only within the context of a democratically elected government, okay? So what a mandate essentially means is, if people have voluntarily surrendered some of their rights or capabilities or ability to do whatever they consider morally fit, what they have in essence done is given you power subject to certain um, caveats on how you use that power, okay? And therefore you have a responsibility to them ahead of other groups. Now to use a, a maybe a more controversial example, if you were doing a debate from the perspective of someone like Donald Trump, you could easily argue that your mandate extends to a very different group of people to the greater good of the United States as a whole, because the individuals that have actually given you your vote are not necessarily all Americans. And I actually think that a lot of the times when we talk about actor debates and then people say, ah, but you know, the dictator acting in this way would be hurting people in their own country. Well, the reason that that doesn't fly is because intuitively we understand that which group you have a priority to 
often depends on who has sacrificed something by choice in order to give you that power in the first place. And that's why it would be perfectly reasonable to say, well, if I'm part of this revolutionary guard, I have a mandate that primarily stems from the admirals and generals of that revolutionary guard who will depose me if I don't, and I should prioritize them ahead of other groups. But mandate is, of course, most often used in the context of a democratic workshop, uh, a democratic, um, uh, a democratically elected government and a democratically elected individual. And so, you know, this workshop is just trying to help you understand how it connects to other things. But by and large, what we're saying here is, if I'm the governor of Texas, my responsibility first and foremost is to fix things in Texas before I start fixing things in Massachusetts. Okay, and the reason for that is because my mandate stems from Texan people and not Massachusettsian people. If any of you are American, please let me know what the demonym for Massachusetts is. Um, and this allows you to differentiate groups that might be more morally significant or pertinent in a particular you know, point in time or for a particular person versus others. It might be that this thing very significantly impacts people who live in Massachusetts, but the mandate is to Texan people. Massachusetts people are not dependent on me like Texan people are dependent on me. I haven't taken things from Massachusetts people and so therefore don't have a debt that I need to repay to them. So the utilitarian framework is just one principled framework that you can argue in a lot of ways should not be followed in this instance, okay? So then the final one is intergenerational. I think that this is certainly the most disputable of them, but is one that is nevertheless kind of, um, I do think that this is something that exists, which is where possible, essentially, we should not restrict the rights of people in the future just because there are people in the now who want that. And this is because if we believe that all individuals have roughly equivalent moral worth, this means that people who live in the future state should also be able to have the same level of evaluation about their own society as the people who live right now. So we should be really careful about taking an action right now if curtailing that in the future. Not to say that we don't do that, we do that all the time. However, this is a consideration we take into account. So for example, if we wanted to, we could deforest 100% of the human planet, the human 100% of planet Earth for the good of the human race and all the people who live right now. We'd have tons of resources. We'd have huge amounts of wealth that would be unlocked. We'd be able to build everything that we wanted. Everyone would have a job and that would probably be good. The reason we're not doing that is because no one in the future will have a tree and then they won't be able to eat anything and then they'll all die. And so we do intuitively and broadly, we do accept this intergenerational principle. Like all the other principles, this is one that you have to take into account and evaluate how strongly it's being affected versus the others. But this boils down to the same thing. And a lot of these boil down to the same thing, which is that where individuals can choose, they should be allowed to. Where their choices would curtail the choices of other people, it should be evaluated how much someone cares about one thing versus how much it stops other people being free to decide who to you know, support. And then separately to that, we should, wherever possible, try and not restrict their choices in ways that they themselves would not consent to. And intergenerational is one of that. We don't want individuals to be born with fewer rights in the future because no one chooses to do that by themselves. So this is an important consideration, even if in the here and now, it benefits people's utilitarian um, happiness. Okay, that was a huge information dump, but if you've been watching this, if you've been recording it, I, and I do really encourage you to like take notes, watch it back, um, then this is it. You know, I've very rarely seen anything happen, even at the uppermost levels of debating, that is not something like this. And people will always do some things better or less, you know, less well. That's always going to be down to practice. It's going to be down to how much you read and the sources that you consult. It's going to be down, I think, to how well you work with your partner and you're able to arrive at things that you can agree on. Um, but, you know, I've dumped a lot of information at you. There isn't much more that you could get. So... Hopefully, at the end of all of this, even if you might have to go back and watch it again, I'm so sorry. Um, you've now started to understand, you know, a very comprehensive list of ways in which you can argue principles and how you can evaluate them and specifically how you can strategically apply them to the logic of your case as a whole. Okay, so the final part of this focuses on some specific case studies related to the questions that we put up on the screen earlier.
So again, I'm going to take a bit of a pause, uh, just give people a chance if they can to ask any questions via the YouTube live chat. Okay, um, it looks like there aren't any questions on this specifically. Hopefully that's because it's, you know, mostly made sense and not because I've confused you so much you don't care anymore. Um, let's go on to the next stage then, which is who kind of has rights and how do we evaluate them? Oh, sorry, there is a question that's coming through. Um, yeah, I'll just wait for it to come through on my live chat and then I'll answer it. Uh, okay, so the question is, how would you define the right to life? And I think this is a really good one because this is one of the rights that we consider most kind of, I guess, fundamental to people. Um, now, one thing that I do want to kind of note here is that the right to life is very contentious. And the basic kind of principle of the right to life is itself easy to understand, but has lots of assumptions that exist alongside it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go back a couple of slides, um, which I think will help illustrate it a little bit better. Um, so if we go back here, okay. So um, when we talk about the right to life in this context, and this is a context that is specifically using, well, the, you know, I'm assuming here we're doing a debate about something like abortion, but this is a right to life that would extend all the way to, um, you know, things like we shouldn't kill people for war or we should be careful not to enact a policy that's going to cause people to die more quickly and so on. Life, in theory, is the prerequisite for the um, execution of, well, okay, so first, life is the prerequisite for the execution of any utilitarian good, which is to say that if I'm dead, I either am unhappy or don't exist and therefore have no happiness or unhappiness. Um, whereas if I'm alive, I could be happy. So if we care about maximizing overall happiness, then life has to be prioritized over unlife and we ought to not kill people. When we get onto the who has rights section, actually, some other justifications for that will come out, but that's kind of the basic one is that if you're dead or you're not alive, you can't be happy. I think there are some further ones, which is that in most cases, um, the right to life is something that um, people have in and of themselves by virtue of their humanhood or humanity. Now, this is one that has been widely accepted in most of human society for most of human history, but it is also one that doesn't have particularly robust, I think, philosophical justifications as far as, um, well, as far as the ways people talk about it in policy. So when you have people that say, ah, oh, this violates the right to life and therefore it's bad, those are often the same people who would happily um, pass policies that might cause some people to die sooner than otherwise, or would, you know, to some extent feel comfortable with nuclear weapons, which, you know, would kill people. So in reality, I think many of the justifications for the right to life stem from, um, stem from tradition, it stems from spirituality. You know, if you believe that there is a religious framework in which the right to life is important because living creatures have souls and that's part of the divine or cosmic intent for the universe, then like much as debaters will try and tell you that they know better, no one knows better than that. Like we can't actually demonstrate that this is untrue. It's just a different framework by which we're applying that justification. In most cases, I think the easiest way to understand the right to life, such that it is useful within the context of debating, is that because individuals have their own moral values, 
They can think about their future and make plans about that. When you kill an individual, what you're doing is you're preventing them from enacting those plans in the future. This is problematic for two reasons, not just that they have um, lost out on the potential happiness that they would have, because even if someone had a terrible plan for their future that would have made them unhappy, it can still be bad to kill them ahead of their time. But also because they are dependent upon you choosing not to kill them in order to make those plans. And when you kill them, you have not just taken away their future, but they might have made different choices in the present, which is in the past, I suppose, before you kill them then, right? And so what you've done is you've also robbed them of fulfilling their own moral priorities by, against their consent, killing them. And this framework of the right to life is the one I find the most useful just because I do think it's the one most people believe. And the reason I think it's the one most people believe is because it's the one that allows in limited cases for people to choose to die. If someone is severely ill and they choose not to continue their medication, that's fine because by this point, it's relatively known to them that, that would be the outcome. And they're no longer regretting the choices they might've made in the past. When you have somebody that's now choosing to go and enact war against an individual and choosing to kill them, well, the reason we distinguish between a legal war and an illegal war, a proportionate loss of life and a disproportionate loss of life, the killing of civilians versus the killing of soldiers, is that soldiers, assuming they signed up voluntarily and not been press ganged, have consented to the possibility their right to life might be curtailed in the future for a different moral value, which is their state or their religion or their community. So the right to life ultimately stems from the same freedom analysis that I gave you earlier, and this is why I think it's just the best form of analysis, because it is so applicable so widely, um, without needing to rely on things that become ultimately impossible to prove or disprove and make debates, you know, fundamentally quite messy. But um, in answer to the initial question, which is how would I define the right to life, that's essentially all it means. It's that living is better than not living because individuals have the right to enact something moral with their lives in accordance with their own preferences. And most debates about whether or not um, abortion should be legal, you know, they center around this idea of right to life. That's actually irrelevant. I think most people, even those who are anti-abortion, believe in our right to life. The limitation actually is whether fetuses are moral creatures deserving of rights, whether that extends to the right to life itself, whether that extends more greatly than the rights to women, rights of women to decide what they do with their life, if that means not having a child in the future. So, you know, within the context of um, Abortion specifically, the right to life is the thing people talk about a lot and it's really relevant. In lots of other cases, no one really talks about the right to life, but that's actually how we're deciding whether we accept or don't accept something. Okay, um, so I'm gonna make the assumption that if anyone else had a question on what we've discussed so far, they would have asked it by now. So I'm just gonna go and skip ahead. Oh, now I regret putting all these animations in. <laughs> skip here. Okay, so this was one of the questions that we got. And it is kind of related to um, the things that we've been talking about so far, which is, where's the right to life come from? How do you decide who has rights and so on? And the question specifically said, what would you consider the principle on op for this house would make the number of votes an individual has proportional to their remaining lifespan? Now, first thing, Utilitarian outcomes are also principles, but I'm assuming that the person who submitted this question, and if you're watching, please do you know, feel free to contribute or clarify if this does not answer that, didn't mean this. So we're gonna gray that out and exclude this for now. Secondly, um, we're gonna assume that the thing that's being proposed is if you have less remaining lifespan, you get more votes. Well, if I were approaching this in a debate, and when I came up with, you know, what you're eventually going to see on this slide, I literally did it in like three, four minutes, um, because that's as much time as you'll have really to dedicate it to a debate in real life. So I don't think this is completely comprehensive. Um, but first, you might start by thinking about those things that are inherent to the policy. So these are stuff that require no characterization. And the only thing that requires no characterization, and these are stuff, uh, these are things that you can get just from looking at the words in the motion, are that if you are older, you're gonna have fewer votes, um, in theory. I mean, if they 
if the prop team debated the other way, they were like, no, 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 we want to give older people more votes because uh, they're going to die sooner and young people can have fewer votes. Like, th firstly, that'd be super dumb. But secondly, it's fine. You can just, you know, turn all of these things into their opposites and it's still cool. Okay, so dependency. The elderly are more likely to rely upon the state and therefore should have more claim upon it, which is to say the elderly require upon the health care that the state provides. The state provides them with care homes. It's necessary for places to be disabled accessible. It's more likely that they're going to need the state in order to put them into contact with other individuals. They provide them with an income because they're too old to work. Long story short, they are dependent upon the state. Young people are less dependent upon the state. Therefore, you should not do this. In fact, if anything, you should do the opposite and the elderly should have more say in how the state works. Next, the elderly are more likely to fall into a state of inhumanity if they're not taken care of by the state, which is to say that the elderly are more likely if they aren't provided with a reasonable income, if they aren't provided with the reasonable quality of health care to fall into a circumstance where they are degraded, where they are unable to make decisions independently, where they are more likely literally to fall ill and suffer then the inability to cognate properly. So this policy, by reducing the power of the elderly and the likelihood that the state reflects the interests of the elderly, because we're, again, no characterization needed, but the number of votes is likely to influence who gets into power and people are going to vote in accordance with their own preferences, is going to push more elderly people into inhumanity. This is not going to be the case for young people. Why? Young people are healthier. Young people have jobs, which means that even if the state isn't taking care of them, they can buy those services or leave. Young people are far more likely to not have lots and lots of dependents, to not have lots and lots of extenuating circumstances. So they're you know, less at risk. Debts or reparations. The elderly have paid international pension pots all their lives. It's their money that the state's deciding how to allocate. So they should not have less of a say on how that money is used compared to young people. Well, the young people haven't yet given up anything in order to participate in society. The youngest person who can vote is probably only just old enough to work in the first place. So there is a reparative responsibility to make sure that we don't disenfranchise the elderly and the state should take care of that. Mandate. The elderly give up as much of their rights as the young to exist in a democratic society. Therefore, they should have equal say in it, which is to say the elderly and the young both have to be subject to the rules of what they can and cannot do. They both have to accept the likelihood that the state might use force against them, and they both have to follow the other policies, economic, social, and political, that the state decides. Those are equivalent between the young and the old, and so giving the young more power on the state violates the mandate that the elderly have also provided to the state. Now, one thing that that does mean, of course, is if there are more old people than young people, then maybe the state should follow the policy of the elderly more. That's not the point. The point is this is a principle that basically means we shouldn't prioritize the young against them. The first three, could, you could even argue that we should give more votes to the elderly, but this one definitely means we should not give um, fewer votes to the elderly than the young. Okay, so already without doing any characterization, and you can talk about the utilitarian policies all the time, you know, until the cows come home, you've got four principles here, just by using this framework that we've talked about. Actually, let's go further than four. Let's do the smallest amount of characterization necessary, which is that the life expectancy of the poor is also lower. So when you're talking about remaining lifespan, then if you're wealthy, that probably does mean you're going to have more of a vote equivalent to if you're younger than someone who is of the same age as you, but poorer. So these three, dependency, essential rights, and mandate, um, essentially it's the same argument as for the elderly, but transmuted over. Do not fall into the trap of thinking these are three separate arguments. This is like one of my number one pet peeves with debaters, is they say, um, this is really gonna affect the poor. It's also gonna affect women actually who earn less. Well, that's not a new argument. That's just a way in which your previous argument now affects more people and maybe should be more important. But there are at least these ways in which the three arguments we've talked about so far, dependency, essential rights, and the mandates that individuals have are strengthened when we apply the minimum amount of characterization. And I mean, again, to go off principles for a second and just talk about mechanization or characterization in debates, and I just do think it's so important and people waste their time so much when it comes to this. You should always do the bare minimum that is necessary to allow you to make another point you intend to make, okay? So 
you might even work backwards and come up with all the points first and then only have as much of a mechanism or a characterization as is necessary to enable that. In this, you literally need no further characterization or mechanism than the life expectancy of the poor is lowered. Thus, overall, they will also be affected, okay? That has unlocked three strengthenings of your existing point already, just those two sentences. But it also unlocks two new points for us. Let's take a look. First, the poor did not choose to be poor, but the past choices of society put them in that position. Therefore, we should prioritize them, and this is the reparative or debt-based justice, when it comes to our policy making, which is to say any policy that specifically disenfranchises the poor is particularly bad. And if anything, we ought to do it the other way, which is to prioritize the poor. And that's what states do all the time. That's what progressive taxation means. But also intergenerational, the effect of this policy is likely to be cyclical. The poor will have fewer votes. Policy will deprioritize their interests, which will widen inequality. This, as we all know, can have huge impact on your expected lifespan. And consequently, future generations of the poor will be born with even fewer votes because their lifespans will be even smaller in comparison to the wealthy. So just by having this framework of five points, excluding utilitarianism, we got four without having to do any characterization. We got two more using just two sentences of characterization. And in about four minutes, I was able to come up with six points principled points distinct from the consequences that one might present in op for this debate. That's the power of principled thinking, and that's the power of doing principled thinking in the way that I presented to you, rather than what people do, which is try and think of the principle once they've thought of the point first. Okay, does anyone have any questions about these arguments or this debate in particular. I think this is relatively self-explanatory. And actually, I don't think that you need to worry about how you might apply this to other debates. That's your homework exercise. Take the left-hand side, utilitarian, dependency, essential rights, debts, mandates, intergenerational, apply it to policy debates. See how many you could come up with. And you know, you can see not every single category will have an obvious policy, uh, sorry, an obvious principle for the policy every single time. But if you think about it like this, you'll quickly unlock more than enough to fill a seven or 14 minute case. Okay, cool. So uh, I'm just conscious that we've kind of been at this for you know, slightly over an hour and, uh, and, and, a, and a bit. So uh, we're gonna quickly start to bring this to an end. Um, so, I got a bunch of questions that basically said, where do rights come from? And they weren't phrased as that. They said, why should humans have distinct moral consideration? Why shouldn't we give full quote unquote human rights to animals that are sentient? Should AI have rights? Answer is, where do rights come from? No one really knows, humanity's dumb. That's why I love AI debates in particular. And I love debates about animal rights. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna talk you through five to six, I think, I can't remember how many I wrote. Um, reasons that you might ascribe rights to someone or something. And um, all of these are highly contested, which is to say it's contested whether these things exist. It's also contested whether, assuming they exist, animals and AI fulfill them. That's fine. The whole point of debating is that we try and argue for one side or the other, um, but just know that this isn't like an absolute truth. Rather, this is supposed to provide you a little bit of a helping hand to get into those answers. So first argument is that a thing is sufficiently intellectually, biologically, or spiritually complex to justify having rights. So essentially this says that we should have more rights than like a potato, a potato should have fewer rights than a rabbit, a rabbit should have fewer rights than a dolphin, which should have fewer rights than a human. And again, this is something that we broadly are able to accept when it comes to the ways in which our society is constructed. Now, if you ask the question, why does intellectual uh, complexity give you rights? Uh, then it gets a bit trickier, but um, I think some of the stuff that we said earlier, which is about the ability to kind of hold moral values um, or at least enact actions and therefore face restrictions starts to come into play. So let's unpack that. The other ways in which people say that rights exist is that they're conscious and aware that they exist. So this is one of the reasons why um, bioethicists and psychologists are so interested in whether or not animals 
um, can look in a mirror and become aware that they're seeing themselves and not another animal. And that level of consciousness has been kind of stipulated by some people as being the benchmark for whether or not um, a, a, you know, an entity has rights. And this is something that maybe comes into play if you're talking about people who are currently comatose and they might be on life support. Well, in that scenario, they are not conscious, they're not aware that they exist, probably, and therefore other people can make decisions about their fundamental rights for them. Again, going back to the earlier question about the right to life, you know, abortion, fetuses, and so on, it's very, very unlikely that for most of the term of a pregnancy, an unborn um, fetus fulfills this criterion. So maybe this is one way in which you can argue about the distinction. As well as that, they know what is happening to them. So it is perfectly possible that um, something is, you know, roughly conscious, but is not aware of things outside its own consciousness. You can think of this as the distinction between the most simple um, life forms that perhaps even have eyes, but don't really understand what's happening to them compared to a jellyfish, um, which just has no idea what's happening to them, but is, you know, aware it exists perhaps. Uh, they can hold preferences. I think this is an important one because if rights are about letting people do the things that are important to them, then being able to think things are important is the necessary logical prerequisite of this. So if a uh, thing can prefer or disprefer something, then that might mean it has some rights or at least we should not deliberately subject it to dispreference, um, which I think is also fine. I mean, that doesn't mean that we have to think a dog as a human, but we can also decide not to hit dogs just for the sake of it um, and to try and be nice to dogs. I actually think you should be nice to dogs for lots of other reasons, but by and large, if we know that a dog dislikes something, it's more important than if they don't. Um, then we start to get to some of the interesting ones. And this is where we, you know, it's, it's very interesting because um, in some ways, the justifications for why an AI might have rights versus an animal might have rights are inverted. We probably don't know whether an AI is conscious, aware it exists, knows what's happening to it or holds preferences. But an AI, unlike a lot of animals, can make choices about its actions. And you know, some animals do make choices about their actions. They also make choices in such a way as to give themselves the best quality of life or to fulfill a pre-held set of preferences. Um, and they have the ability to conceptualize a, a future and to plan their life going into the long term, um, which means that the quality and length of their life matters to them. Well, you know, these are the sort of, uh, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, eight-ish things that let us maybe start to understand where rights come from. You could very convincingly make a case that lots of animals fulfill all eight of these and are pretty much meeting the same benchmarks that humans do. You could equally make a case that AI, if not right now, at some point in the future, will make these. You can also make a case that even if animals fulfill all of these, humans will always fulfill all eight of them great, more greatly. And so human decisions about what should happen to AI or animals should predominate over those animals because the comparison of which rights they have and how strongly they're held tips in the favor of humans. Um, so I don't necessarily think, again, that this is an easy one, but these are some of the things that we talk about when it comes to the sources of rights. Ultimately then, if we're going right back to the start of this debate, uh, sorry, you can tell I'm a debater. If we go right back to the start of this presentation, we're talking about principles. Most principles are ways in which we evaluate what is right and how we should make one of multiple competing decisions. The things that we consider important principles should stem from as uncontroversial a statement as possible and then be developed into more complex or sophisticated statements. This then allows us to trade off multiple different frameworks of morality at once when overall evaluating whether we should do something or something else. And a lot of those things fall down to the question of what rights does an individual have? And if we go back to the you know, frameworks from before, things like dependency and debt, those are responsibilities that we have towards things that have rights. And then these things have rights for the eight reasons that are on the screen right now. So that's the end broadly of my masterclass on principled argumentation. I hope it has been useful. Um, and please do feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions about some of the, you know, some of the stuff that we've discussed in, in this presentation today. Um, 
we do just have a little bit of time before I'd like to bring this presentation to a close. So if there are any further questions that people have either about principled argumentation or about debating as a whole, and or, you know, maybe I can help in some way there as well. So I'm gonna pause. If you have a question, just please say you have a question in the chat and you know, I'll give you the time to kind of type it out. Um, but apart from that, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for um, organizing this to the Astana UDC team. And especially given the quite tumultuous circumstances that we're in globally, I hope you're all keeping safe. And I'd like to congratulate them for doing a really phenomenal job under quite difficult circumstances. Oh, sorry, I thought a question had come through in the chat. It's just the Astana Debate Union saying thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> Okay, um, so it looks like there aren't any immediate questions right now. Um, and that's that's fine. I really hope that this was useful to you. If you do want to find me, you can find me at that Nishpre, um on Instagram and at Nishith Hegde on Facebook. Um, these are the ones that I probably like check the most. So if you do want to get in touch with me or ask any further questions, um, then I would certainly recommend that you go to these social media platforms. I would be more than happy to kind of answer any of them. One other thing is that I'll make sure that the slides that I use today are available and circulated. And so if you wanna go back and kind of flick through some of the stuff that we discussed, um, or if you would like to kind of take them, print them out and put them in your own case file, then please feel free to do so. Um, I've definitely achieved pretty much anything I might want to with debating and it's, it's sort of in my rear view mirror now. So um, I have nothing to lose from just letting you have it and I do hope you find it all useful. Apart from that, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out to join me today. Hope you're all keeping safe and I'll speak to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>